welcome everybody. This is getting our recording going, all of that. Very good. I think we have our all our technology. Um, so uh, so anyway, so thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate it. I'm just going to kick off the meeting and say welcome. And this is Commissioner Mary Cuny, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Justin and let him run the meeting from here. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cuny. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Justin Jotka, I'm here with the uh, Spokane County Community ASO. Uh, to cut down on some of the conversations and introductions, uh, we would ask everyone, if you could, please put your name and organization in the chat. And we'll collect those. And I think that's the best way right now to collect those because uh, we're working both from in the room here and with those online and we cannot see anybody. So if you could put those in there, that'd be terrific. Excellent. And to start us off, we have updates from the healthcare authority. So I believe we had noticed that uh, Amber leaders would not be joining us from the governor's office. And I wanna just double check, Amber or anyone from the governor's office, are they joining us on this call? All right, giving the obligatory three second wait, I will turn it over to the healthcare authority. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, who you guys want to start with. We have Luke Wagner first on there and Michelle Roberts, and I'll turn it over to the EPA. Amira, are you on from Department of Health? Oh, I'm here. We also had um, sent in a slide, some slides to go along with our little update. Are those available? Yes. Well, I was looking for them. We are locating them right now. Is that the right one? There they are. There they are. Okay. Is that the correct slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. I guess I'm starting. Thank you. Okay then. Um, well, um, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to present today. I'm not Michelle Roberts. I'm Amira Kalea, I'm 90 Implementation Specialist at the Department of Health. My pronouns are they, them. And I'll be presenting um, my portion for today's presentation is going to cover the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline and how we've implemented that so far in Washington State. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so our state is really fortunate to have legislators and um, state agency leadership who understand the importance of having a strong crisis response system. Um, and they saw the need benefit for having a number for people to contact when they're in crisis. Um, as our state started to gear up for the transition to 988, the Washington State Legislature passed in gross second substitute House Bill 1477 which is also known as the Crisis Call Center Hubs and Crisis Services Bill. Um, this bill enhances the crisis call and response platform and the behavioral health integrated client referral system. It requires um, the healthcare authority and the Department of Health to do certain things as well. So um, the healthcare authority is required to collaborate with us at the Department of Health to produce a technical and operational plan. Um, and we'll be talking about that a little later in the presentation, um, but it also requires the Department of Health to create rules with standards um, that crisis centers must meet to be um, designated as crisis call center hubs. And then it requires the Department of Health to de designate those crisis call center hubs. Um, so we are in the middle of our rulemaking. Oh, I almost got a hot mic. Uh, there we go. Um, okay. Um, uh, so it also, let's see here. Um, we are in the middle of the rulemaking process right now. Um, we've had uh, three listening sessions. Oops. Um, if you could just go back to the last slide that I was on. Um, so uh, we've heard from folks um, who've used crisis lines for themselves on behalf of others, crisis call center staff. 
um, in the listening sessions. Um, if you do want more information about how you can get involved in the upcoming workshops in our rulemaking process, um, I'm happy to add you to our contact info list um, when we announce those dates and registration info as they are uh, open to the public. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. Um, and speaking of crisis centers, so we have three in our state who are accredited to answer 988 calls. So that's Crisis Connections, um, Frontier Behavioral Health, and Volunteers of America Western Washington. And you can see in this map on this slide um, which counties um, each of the crisis centers cover. Um, and um, Volunteers of America is currently the only crisis center who is accredited to um, answer text and chat messages at this time. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, the Native and Strong Lifeline launched in our state on November 10th. Um, if you call 988, you can press 988 uh, with a uh, Washington State area code and callers uh, can press 4 to be connected to the Native and Strong Lifeline. Um, this is the first of its kind in the nation. It's dedicated to serving American Indian and Alaska Native people. Um, calls are answered by Native people or descendants who have close ties to their communities. Um, the crisis counselors who answer this line are um, fully trained in crisis intervention and support with special emphasis on um, cultural and traditional practices related to healing and um, Volunteers of uh, America Western Washington administers this line and is in charge of answering um, Native and Strong Lifeline calls. And then if you could move on to the next slide. Um, and here we have some data. Uh, the left side of this slide shows some data points um, from Vibrant Emotional Health, um, which is the National Administration Administrator for um, uh, 988, um, and this is from the fiscal year 2021. These are the national numbers, and we've not received an update since 988 launched in July, but I do expect um, these numbers to have increased quite a bit. Um, on the right is uh, current numbers from our state since 988 launched in July through October. Um, we get monthly state level data from Vibrant and should be getting our November numbers in a couple of weeks. Um, our state's overall answer rate for calls routed to our three crisis call centers combined is at 89% right now. Um, the standard is at 90%, um, so we're just about there. We were at 90% in August um, and we dipped a percentage point in September and October. And um, and that is it for my portion. If you could go to the next slide just so that folks can get my email address. Um, thank you again. Um, again, if you'd like to receive announcements about the rulemaking process um, and other events that are upcoming related to the rulemaking process, you can email me at amira.kaluya at doh.wada.gov. Okay, I think I'm up next. Luke Wagoner from the Healthcare Authority, Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. If you go to the next slide, just give a quick overview and update of the CRIS uh, committee process um, and what we've been working on in the last couple months and what's coming up in the next few months. Um, I work in the crisis system team who uh, has primary responsibility for clinical crisis services related to 1477 and 988. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So just quickly, many of you are probably familiar with this, but um, House Bill 1477 established the CRIS committee. So we have a steering committee, CRIS committee, and several subcommittees that have been meeting regularly um, since the end of 2021 and early 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, high-level work plan was developed. They're exactly well issues. Sorry. Hey, Mark, I think your phone's off mute. All right. So um, high-level work plan uh, related to 1477 identified five objectives. You can see here 
uh, that we've been working on. So a place to call someone to respond, a place to go pre and post crisis care and crisis system infrastructure, infrastructure and oversight. Um, we have multiple state agencies that are responsible for this implementation. Um, and work's been ongoing uh, on uh, throughout through the committee process on these objectives. Next slide, please. So the big project of this summer and fall was the technical and operational plan. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this was developed in collaboration with Department of Health and Healthcare Authority. Um, we spent many hours uh, editing and re-editing and uh, going over this document that um, was called for in 1477 to identify um, the components needed, the technology needed to implement um, a call center platform and client referral system and other ancillary systems. So um, this plan now has, has gone through an extensive review process um, that you can see on the next slide. So a number of reviewers, the governor's office, um, Office of Financial Management, the Chris Committee, of course, and the Steering Committee, um, a number of legislative uh, bodies or organizations, and now has received approval um, and we're moving forward. So um, what's happening next? Um, you can go to the next slide. So, um, now that the technical and operational plan is completed, uh, we are working on an RFI uh, to gather information from potential vendors, um, technology vendors that could provide this technology system that we would be utilizing in the, in the future. Um, we're trying to get that process done quickly so that we can have information to help guide the legislature as they're looking at funding for this, uh, for this technology. Um, and moving into the RFP process. Um, the other thing that's coming soon is the um, second progress report to the Chris Committee. So that that draft will be um, presented to the Chris Committee on December 13th at 2 p.m. Uh, that is a public meeting. Um, if you'd like to attend, um, I know that this meeting today is a hybrid between uh, in person and uh, virtual. I am putting the link to the Chris website in the chat um, so you could go and register for that meeting if you'd like to participate. Um, you do have an opportunity to, for public comment at those meetings. Um, and then that document, once it's approved um, um, for, for the public, will be also available on that same website. Um, then we've got a lot of work coming up um, in the next uh, year. So We've got um, system goals and metrics to identify, crisis system services um, to look at, what, where are the gaps, where do we need to um, bring in new services, funding for those things, and um, infrastructure. In addition, so um, my team has been working on a gaps, barriers, and opportunities white paper. That's in final review now, and we expect that to be available um, to kind of present some of the areas that we see where we have opportunities to um, bring in new services into our state um, that can enhance our crisis system. And of course, legislative sessions. So we have uh, several decision packages going to the legislature or to the governor and to be looked at for the governor's budget related to technology and services, both from Department of Health and Healthcare Authority. And of course, um, we expect this legislative session to um, be active related to our ongoing um, work related to our crisis system. Thank you. On the last slide here, there's contact information for our team as well. Um, feel free to reach out at any point if you have any questions or comments. Uh, getting on mute there. Thank you so much, Luke, for sharing that. I want to open it up to any questions uh, for those who are on the call uh, or in the chat.
I don't see any questions on the chat or in phone line there. We will turn it over to uh, Megan Atkinson and Nina Devish. I think we have you on the next on the list. Oh, and uh, Jason McGill. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Medina, I, I, I know I saw Medina on. I don't think I saw Megan today, but Medina. Yes, me I'm just, here. Hey, uh, Megan there is, you are. She, could, she has a conflict. She couldn't join this meeting. I thought so too. So that's fine. Well, I think we're here to talk just generally about giving you an update on where we're at with regard to um, some of the um, preparations for 2023 and um, happy to do that and stand uh, take some time for any questions. Medina, did you want to just start with some general updates on the uh, 2023 rates and the 7% or how would you like to proceed? Um, yeah, um, we finalized the rates for 2023. Uh, the rate certification package was submitted to CMS for review and approval on October 1, 2022. We are required by federal rules to submit this information to CMS 90 days prior to the beginning of the rating period. Uh, so we met that deadline. Uh, we also updated the contracts, integrated managed care contracts between HCA and managed care organizations to um, specific to 7% rate increase language. And this was, as you know, part of the 2022 supplemental budget, uh, which included 7% rating, rate increase to community behavioral health providers contracted through managed care organizations. And this rate increase is applicable to um, all CBH services um, provided through behavioral health inpatient, residential, outpatient providers. Uh, so we updated our contracts with MCOs and we also issued formal communication to MCOs um, a few days ago in a form of FAQ, kind of clarifying our expectations for, um, for this rate increase, just to make sure that managed care organizations implement this rate increase um, timely, appropriately, and accurately. I think these are all my updates. Jason, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I think you you covered the high points there, Medina, and it might be good to just uh, take some questions, um, or if there's anything you'd like us to talk about in any more detail. Information up. I, uh, Jason or Medina, is there a slide that you would like us to be showing as well? I want to make sure we're capturing what you're talking about and on the screen we have it. I don't think we do. Uh, we will have, as Medina noted, we will have some material um, that we will be sending out here um, soon. Um, you do have, it looks like, a slide here about the comparison rate work. Medina, do you have anything more on that you'd like to share? You covered it, you touched on it briefly. Um, no, I don't have anything on the comparison work, Jason. Um, I think that the, the big piece of work coming up really is to implement the 2023 managed care rates, as Medina mentioned. So, um, and, and just some clarity on that with regard to the 7% rate increase for behavioral health uh, agency providers starting January 1. Uh, we will have some information um, that we're working through final uh, communications on that. So let's follow up on that. We'll make sure to send you uh, that material once that is complete. Um, other than that, um, any any questions for us? And it looks like Kim is next on the hundred million uh, uh, distribution, which of course relates to all of this work, but a, a pretty intensive project in of itself. 
I'm seeing no questions in the chat. Any questions in the uh, room here or on the line? Well, I'll tell you what, I will stay on. I plan to stay on uh, this afternoon and, and listen in. And if there's other questions or chat, um, I'll, uh, I'll be ready and around if, if needed. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, thank you for that, because I think it's going to be important to have you, you know, listening as, as we talk about those workforce challenges, um, you know, a little bit later on in the conversation. So thank you. Of course. All right, Kim, you're up. Great. Thanks for having me today. Uh, Kimberly Wright. I'm the Behavioral Health Policy and Planning Supervisor for Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. And I've had the pleasure of managing the 100 million workforce stabilization provider relief funding. Um, so pretty quick update for you today and then happy to take questions. We do have 97 million, over 97 million in contract to eligible behavioral health agencies. We have 92 million that has currently been paid out to behavioral health agencies and is in the hands of those providers now. Um, and we are hearing some interesting things about uses already, so excited about that. There is some remaining cleanup for HCA to do on the disputes and other considerations before reconciling what funding might remain. And we anticipate that this reconciliation will be done in early January. It'll be completed by early January, 2023. Um, after that, we do plan the provider survey for how the funds were utilized from June through July of 2023. And then we'll use that survey information to inform our report um, and have that report on the use of the workforce stabilization funds, which we expect to be available in December of 2023. And I'm available for questions. Moving on here, I don't see any questions in the chat. Any questions for those on the line for Kim? Excellent. Very much appreciate that, Kim. I know a lot of our providers have reached out and expressed that uh, they've been receiving those and are working through getting that money out. Um, and addressing some of the challenges. So very much appreciate healthcare authority support and quick turnaround and getting those funds out. Thank you. It's been a really interesting project to manage and I'm really interested as I start to hear the uses of the funds. So excited for this next step. Awesome. Thank you. All right, uh, before we move on to uh, topic number three, I wanna make sure that we provided uh, any other opportunity for the healthcare authority to speak on any of the topics. Is there anyone else from the healthcare authority that would like to touch base on any of those topics. Excellent. Hearing none, I will move on to our topic number three. Tanya, it looks like you're up. 90 day call line update for our region. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tanya Stern. I'm the service director with Frontier Behavioral Health. Um, our friends at HCA did a presentation touched on 980, so we may be able to move through some of these slides because there's some um, duplicate information. Um, I just might share if we can go to the next slide for a recap. Um, I think most people are familiar with 988, but uh, just in case for those of you who may be new to this meeting or weren't able to join the Spokane Regional Crisis Collaborative in September when we also presented on a 988 update. This is a three digit number for 24 seven call, text, chat, crisis services, 365 days a year uh, for anyone living in the United States. It is not just um, a line to call if you're experiencing suicidal thoughts. We have individuals who are calling for other types of emotional distress, or a mental health or substance use crisis. Um, they do have access through their cell phones, not just landlines, as well as any voice over internet device. 988 operates through the National Suicide Prevention Life Life Lifeline Network. And as um, our representatives from, from HCA shared, we do have three NSPL um, lines within Washington State. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, 
in those three centers, there is a slide coming up I'll be skipping since our friends from HCA mentioned it, but the three centers in Washington are Frontier Behavioral Health, Volunteers of America of Western Washington and Crisis Connections. Um, HCA also mentioned our Native and Strong Lifeline, which started November 10th. Um, when you call 988, if you press four, um, you can get the Native and Strong Lifeline. But I also wanted to share if you press one after calling 988, you can um, get connected to the Veterans Crisis Line. Callers can press two in order to be able to have services um, in Spanish. Um, also, I just want to share there are interpretation services available, uh, vibrant contracts with um, a language uh, line solutions, and there's over 250 languages. Text and chat are only available in English, and chat is available through the Lifelines website, and Volunteers of America of Western Washington um, handles in Washington all the text and chat, as HCA mentioned. If we could um, flip two slides. Great, thank you. Um, I do want to just reinforce and share for everybody that although 988 has been implemented as of uh, July 16th of 2022, um, the 10 digit National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is still- I'm sorry. Oh, cool. Did uh, somebody have a question? Or is maybe somebody not on mute? Yeah, Allison, I think you're off mute. Okay, thank you. Um, also, uh, the BHASO's regional crisis lines are also in effect, and you can see um, that greenish color on the far right, the six counties for our region, Adams, Ferry, Lincoln, Ponderay, Spokane, and Stevens County. Um, our 10 digit uh, regional crisis line number is also still operational in effect and we're taking calls. Um, so just to share, I mentioned we have six counties, Volunteers of America Western Washington has 32 counties and Crisis Connection covers one county, King County, a very large county. Um, I wanted to share a little bit since this is a regional update um, about how it has been going for Frontier Behavioral Health. Um, we are very excited that prior to implementation of 988, we were to able to get a new phone system um, in order to enable staff to be able to work remotely, which has been really helpful with power outages that occur in our area. Um, when everyone is working in the office and there's an outage, there can be a delay until we get our business continuity um, secondary backup um, in effect. But with having some staff working remotely, they're typically not affected by the outage because they live all um, over Spokane as well as outside of Spokane. And so they can continue taking calls while we get our secondary backup product in effect. Um, and we've been able to develop something that um, moves over very quickly through a Verizon product. Um, we've also made a lot of strides, at least with the regional crisis line, in filling our vacant positions. We're actually down to only three positions to fill out of 38, um, which is really exciting. Um, another position we're working on is a diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion coordinator. We're actively recruiting for that position. Um, and they're going to be developing and providing trainings to our crisis call center staff to help them on providing culturally affirming crisis services for all communities within our region um, for a variety of factors, geographical location, gender um, identity, sexual identity, race, ethnicity, national origin, um, and other identities. We're really excited about that. It's important to us that we make sure we're responsive and supportive um, to all individuals who need our services. We've also in the meantime been working, we got access to a special training on uh, delivering crisis services to farm workers, because we know we do have farm workers and ranchers in our rural counties that are within our region. Um, so our staff have been working on doing that. Um, if we could move to the next slide. 
Thought I'd share a little bit of pre and post 988 implementation data for our region specifically. So in fiscal year 2022, which was July 1st of 2021 to June 30th of 2022, I wanted to share our monthly average. I'm including our averages um, for the 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline as well as uh, our regional crisis line. Um, our staff do take calls for our region um, from both of those lines. Between the two lines in fiscal year 2022, our monthly average was 4,000 calls a month. 3,743 of those were through the regional crisis line and 257 um, of those calls would be through the lifeline. You'll notice when you look at the length of call, I think it's important to note that our lifeline calls were almost twice as long as our regional crisis line. Now remember those are averages. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting for you to see what does that look like for the data we have so far for uh, four full months, August through November of 2022. Um, so we're having about, you'll see an increase in our 988 lifeline calls. The monthly average is now 350 calls uh, with a length of, um, average length of call of 12 minutes, 20 seconds. So it's increased by about six seconds. Uh, this number would be higher, um, except for we noticed a little bit of a decrease um, in November compared to the other months. I'm not sure what that's about. If that's a trend, we'll have to watch out for that. Um, or if it was just, you know, due to uh, families getting together for Thanksgiving, um, we'll have to see. Our uh, monthly average of those four months for regional crisis line calls were 3,625. And you'll also notice the average length of call increased a little bit um, by about 33 seconds for our RCL calls as well. We can move to the next slide, provide a slide to kind of break that down by month. And one thing I think just to kind of summarize between both lines over this four month period, um, we responded to 15,897 crisis calls between both of those lines. We can move to the next slide. I uh, also wanted to share, as I mentioned before, a couple slides back, um, the monthly average for fiscal year 2022 between both lines was 4,000. We've seen a slight decrease between um, these four months that we've been looking at um, just by about 26 calls. Um, and I think that's attributed to the decrease we saw in November. We can move to the next slide, please. I thought it might be helpful for our regional partners because we do have some representative from our rural counties here to kind of break out what does that look like for the calls for 988 specifically in Lifeline by County. We get a report from Vibrant each month that breaks this out. We haven't gotten our November report yet, but for August through October, um, the majority of our calls coming in 988 or the 10 digit Lifeline number are from Spokane County. Um, we consistently get about six calls or less from um, individuals associated with Adams Fair and Pondray County. Uh, Lincoln County has been really interesting because there's been a rain um, from September through October, but I mean, excuse me, August through October. Um, anywhere from one month, we got six calls, another month, 17, and um, then the third month, 23. So there's just been an interesting range. And for Stevens County, um, over those three months, um, one month, we got 12 calls, another month, 13, and another 15. Um, so hopefully that's helpful information for our rural partners. Hey, Tanya, David Nielsen, are those unduplicated callers or is that uh, calls that could have come from, you know, could have been six calls from one person? The data that Vibrant provides doesn't break that out for us, David. So it could be duplicate callers. We would have to actually like dig in to, you know, our records uh, to find that out. Vibrant doesn't break that out by number. So hey, thank you. Question. Uh, any other questions before we move on? 
Okay, just check in chat. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, uh, I added some additional data because this was a question from the September Spokane Regional Crisis Collaborative. There was an interest like, what is the um, age range, the top three um, for 988 Lifeline? I do want to emphasize this data is very limited because I would say only about 30% um, of callers into 988 and Lifeline numbers identify themselves and provide identifying information. So again, this is limited, but based on um, the, the callers who do share information, it's been consistent between fiscal year 2022 and August through November of, oh, I see a typo, that should be 2022 on the right there. Um, ages, we get most calls from individuals ages 20, to 29 years old, at least those who will identify information about themselves. Uh, it has also been consistent um, that the second largest call volume then would be ages 30 through 39. And you notice there's a little change from fiscal year 2022 to August through November of 2022. Whereas uh, in the previous fiscal year, the third um, largest call volume was ages 13 to 17 years old. And for August through November, uh, our, our third largest call volume is individuals ages 50 through 59, but our ages 13 through 17 did come into fourth. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful information, but I did wanna follow up because I made some promises to individuals who asked questions in September um, to provide an update on that information. So if there's any other questions anyone has, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, well, thank you everybody for your time. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing. I, I wanna do just say a quick shout out to FBH and RCL and 98. One of the unique things about our system uh, as opposed to uh, across the state is we have a vertical integration. So from the point the calls are received to the point that individuals receive a service, those are all dispatched out. Whereas the other um, uh, 98 lines actually are still working on integration of the dispatching. So the really cool aspect in our region is where calls receive the lag time between when a service gets out as if in Spokane County is minimized because of the ability for FBH to both run the line, the RCL and the service providers going out. So I know that has uh, really ensured a seamless response in the Spokane County and uh, neighboring regions. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions on the chat uh, or on the line here. So we're gonna move on to our next topic. So we um, are following up with our last meeting where we discussed some of the workforce challenges that providers have uh, put forward. And we had put out a question to those and have been in attendance who are a part of the Squillis membership. And uh, we have a few here on the line that we're going to share a little bit about what they're experiencing, not only in their region, but also within their agencies in terms of the workforce. So uh, I'm gonna start with Jeff uh, from FBH. Are you on the line here? Yes, I am. Hey Justin, before Jeff before Jeff gets going, I sent you guys my slides at the beginning of the meeting. Can you confirm that you got those? Thanks. Uh, we did get it, David. Uh, give us a second to uh, pull that up from the uh, email. So uh, Jeff, if you want to proceed forward, we'll work on our end to pull up that email for uh, New Alliance, which is next. Yep, you bet. So yeah, I I feel like I was set up a little bit. Tanya gets to talk about all this uh, new and exciting stuff we're doing, and and then I'm a little bit more of a downer talking about something that's less fun, but necessary to talk about. So I was scheduled to provide an update at the, as many of you are aware, uh, at the uh, September Skrills meeting on this topic, that, on the meeting that got canceled. But some of what I would, had planned to share there, I think, is still has relevance, even though it's, it's a bit dated. So I'll kind of fly through that and then give some updated information. But as of that point in time, um, INBH uh, had one of their 25-bed uh, units out of their 100-bed facility that had been closed for quite some time due to inability to staff it adequately. 
at that time, Excelsior, and it, it, that has since reopened, by the way, Excelsior had not yet opened um, beds that they'd received capital funding for the preceding year due to inability to staff. Eastern State Hospital at that time, uh, according to the source I had, had a vacancy rate of 35% and growing for nurses. They hadn't closed a unit, but was, they were paying 70 to 80 temps or locums at significantly higher cost. Pioneers New Stabilization Facility had been able to get fully staffed, but in talking with their leadership, uh, they had basically had to redeploy staff from other programs, uh, creating vacancies and depleting staff in other programs. Outside our region, but I still, still think germane because it's, it all touches in one way or another. Comprehensive Health had had to close one of its CNTs, one in CLA due to workforce shortages. Fairfax Hospital in Kirkland had closed a children's unit. Just across the border here in Idaho, Kootenai Health had closed its outpatient psychiatric program and inpatient SEUD unit at that point. And we had made the decision to close our 16-bed stabilization program um, based on a combination of staffing challenges and low utilization. So in the time since then, a couple of additional uh, reference points. One is um, for purposes um, related to uh, our mayor's uh, mental health task force, we at Frontier uh, conducted a survey of 14 outpatient providers in Spokane regarding vacancy rates and impact. And it's is, is a very short survey, just a few questions that I'll share with you. What is your current master's level clinical vacancy rate? Uh, the average is 25%. The range was from 10%. I don't know who that lucky um, provider was, to 50%. And two or more providers, or two providers, had that number. Do you currently have a wait list to get into services? 72% uh, said yes. Are you scheduling intake appointments significantly further out than historically? 80% said yes. Has the number of new clients you're able to enroll decreased? 80% said yes. Have you had to close a program or service location? 36% said yes. So that was that's a little dated, but not terribly. It was, it was this past, it was late September, early October. Um, the second point of reference I'll share is to do a survey by the Washington Council for Behavioral Health. Uh, did a, we did a, a survey in August of 2021. We did a follow-up survey just this past month. The summary report has not yet been released, so I'm not at liberty to share the specifics, but I'm going to give you um, a general sense of it. And there's just um, four questions that we're, I'll, I'll touch on. One is vacancy rates. In 2021, the survey reflected uh, a a vacancy rate for master's level clinical staff of 26% and for all staff of 18%. I can tell you that the 2022 survey results without being specific show that that has worsened, uh, not gotten better. In the 2021 survey on turnover rates, um, it indicated a turnover rate of 28% for master's level clinical staff, 29% for all staff. That's also something that when the results are released, it will show that it's worsened, not gotten better. Average time to fill critical positions. In 2021, uh, the organizations responding indicated 5.5 months. The 2022 results will reflect something even longer than that. And the fourth and final one, impact on programs in 2021, 54% of the agencies reported having either closed programs or significantly reduce the access to the services or both. Once again, this is something that you, when you see the 2022 survey results, will show that it's gotten worse, not better. So Frontier, uh, without getting into all kinds of details beyond the scope of uh, what's appropriate for today, but we do continue to struggle with this very much so, just as with everybody else. Um, Tanya reported we are extremely fortunate for the time being to uh, have low vacancy rates you know, on our regional crisis line 988 line. That's not the case throughout the agency. In some programs, we have vacancy rates that are um, 20, 30%. In some cases, 40, 50, 60%. It's, um, it, is, it is extremely challenging. We are very hopeful and uh, uh, shout another thanks to our HCA friends and, and indirectly to our uh, legislators who aren't on, on the, this meeting, I don't believe, for the uh, 100 million uh, in in sort of uh, provider relief funding uh, and the 7% uh, rate increases and non-Medicaid increases, we've parlayed that all into um, staff compensation. We're hopeful that that's going to make a difference. We haven't seen that yet, but it's it's still early in the game. But very much appreciated. Of course, the inflation rate that was higher than that didn't wasn't our best friend this year. But that's nothing anybody could do anything about here. 
uh, in, in our state. Um, the final thing I'll just comment on and then pass it on to or that would be next is something I think we're just going to have to continue to grapple with, which is the tension, for lack of a better word, uh, that exists between continuing uh, the state continuing to provide uh, capital funding for uh, new and additional facilities and for more programs on the operational funding side um, when doing so um, really it just serves to create more competition for a workforce that is already scarce, and it makes it that much more challenging to maintain and sustain existing programs. And I'll tell you, at Frontier this past year, we've added a number of programs that there was funding available and there was funding that was going to be uh, provided and given to someone in our region. We were the logical someone, so we did step up, but it was certainly um, uh, not begrudgingly, but not without its challenges for us to add programs and services when we're having these huge vacancy rates that already exist. So I just think that's a, a continued um, tension point that's going to have to be grappled with uh, by folks at various levels throughout, whether it's legislatively or it's at state, um, state or county levels. So thank you for your ear. And if there's any questions for me, I don't know, questions will probably come later, I'm guessing, right, Justin? I want to pass it on to the others. Uh, yes, we can definitely do that uh, or give a quick second if there's a burning question. Uh, so, Jeff, this is Mary Cuny. I've, I've got, you know, a quick question just for you because I'm hearing on the behavioral health co-deployed teams uh, for law enforcement that uh, you're having a, a, a real time staffing those. So, if, I mean, because that's such an integral part of you know, uh, what, what we've been looking at and trying to help the community in so many ways and not being able to staff that is, um, you know, definitely an issue too. I mean, so so I don't know if you can speak to that. Oh, yeah, no, happy to, yeah. Um, I couldn't tell you this minute what our vacancy rate is, but it's, I think out of our 11 co-responder positions, I'd say maybe six or seven, I think seven of them are vacant. It's it's very much a problem. We had two give resignations a couple of weeks ago to accept positions at Eastern State Hospital, uh, making uh, salaries that are ninety thousand range, where we're paying about sixty thousand for the master's level. So hard to tell, hard to be able to uh, get them to stay when they're going for that kind of an increase. So yeah, it continues to be a real real challenge, and um, and it's. Um, it's pervasive across all programs, including ones like the one you mentioned. Yeah, no, thank you. All right, I believe you are up next, David. Uh, we'll pull open the PowerPoint for you. Great, thank you. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Nielsen, the Executive Director of Northeast Washington Alliance Counseling Services. Uh, and we provide the behavioral health services for Ferry, Stevens, and Lincoln County. And we can go ahead and just start with slide two, because my first slide was kind of doing the same thing that Jeff was doing, which is talking about all the different uh, facilities that have been uh, shut down and losing staff around the state over the uh, past year or two, really to kind of emphasize that the workforce shortage that we're seeing is not unique to Frontier or to New Alliance, but it's really a, a statewide and a nationwide uh, issue. But I want to focus on more specifically about what it's been like at our agency. And we're looking at it, this very first slide here um, is what has gone on with our workforce from pre-COVID up through now. So if we were to go back to our books, we have about 163 positions on our books. Uh, and you know we've never been at 100% capacity. Back in 2020, before COVID, uh, we had 151 people on the books. Uh, we average about a 30% workforce turnover per year. Uh, and in 2020, that was 47 people that we turned over in one year across uh, our three counties and all the different programs that we have. Um, we get into 2021 and uh, our turnover rate jumped up to 44%, losing 62 of our employees that year. Some of that was actually driven uh, by the governor's mandate. And I think aside from individual perceptions about vaccines. I'm a big vaccine believer. I've had five COVID vaccines at this point, um, but that it's not well taken by all of our workforce. Uh, we had 13 people that just left uh, as a result of the mandate to get vaccinated. So if, if we didn't have the vaccine mandate, our workforce turnover would have dropped from 44% that year uh, to 34%. 
uh, like Jeff, I did a lot of my preparation for this back when we were talking in September. So as of uh, middle of September this year, um, our total workforce has dropped from 151 employees in 2020 down to 125 uh, in mid-September. And year to date, our workforce turnover was 18.4%. Uh, so you can see that we've got just you know, a steady reduction in our workforce, um, despite what has uh, been an increased demand for services and an increased demand for new programs that we've had in contracts that come uh, from our partners. So we're, we're certainly feeling acutely the, um, a, a workforce shortage. Next slide, please. When we kind of take our employee classifications and break it down into specific categories, there's two places where we feel the workforce shortage most acutely. Um, so what I'm circling here is uh, for uh, the very first red circle is for our behavioral health technicians. So these are certified nursing level uh, equivalent staff that work at our inpatient facilities. Uh, where in September we were at a 31% vacancy for those positions. And that has a direct impact on our ability to admit people uh, to our inpatient 16 bed evaluation and treatment facility and our crisis stabilization house that we have here in Colville. Uh, and when I take a shortage like that and I combine it with the COVID outbreaks, uh, we're, we're actually today currently in our third COVID outbreak in 2022 at our inpatient unit. When you take COVID outbreaks and then a workforce shortage of 30% of technicians, um, that has a direct negative impact on our revenue. And one of my slides that you'll see later on is that uh, we've operated at 65% capacity of our inpatient unit year to date uh, because of workforce shortage uh, complied with the impacts of COVID. The second red slide uh, circle that you're seeing there is our master's level clinicians. 37% uh, vacancy across uh, our five outpatient office locations in the three different counties, uh, which again has a direct impact on our ability to provide outpatient behavioral health care services. Uh, ironically, the places that we've been doing well is prescribers, which historically had been difficult for us, but 100% uh, staffed with prescribers right now, and administration positions are easy to fill. It's those master's level uh, positions that are really, really hurting us. Next slide, please. This is taking the previous slide and just turning it from percentages into actual numbers. Um, so down 13 master's level positions across our uh, our five outpatient office locations. Next slide. So as we you know, start asking the question, what's the impact on service? If we're down you know, a third of our master's level clinicians, we would certainly expect to be down on the number of services that we're providing year to date. Uh, that the top line that's going down that shows a 23% decrease, uh, that's just our outpatient mental health program across all three of the counties combined. Uh, the number of services per year that had been provided. And for 2022, we were projecting what we would finish at uh, in September based on uh, the current percentage of services that were being provided. So down 30% of our master's level clinician, uh, a 20% decrease in the number of services that we've been providing. Uh, whereas for Y services, we've been holding close to, uh, to average. Uh, crisis services have had a decrease in services, as, uh, decrease in the number of services as well. Contrast this with the next slide. Here we're looking at the number of clients that we have served per year going back to 2020. And what we're seeing is across the mental health program, the WISE services and our crisis per program, we've actually been serving more unique clients. And so what the story is telling us is that since we have fewer master's level clinicians, we're actually seeing more clients than we had seen in 2020, but the clients who are coming in are getting significantly fewer services than they would have received, largely because we don't have the staff. So people are coming in, they're being seen less frequently, they're getting less intense care because we don't have the number of clinicians. Um, and ironically, whereas other agencies, I think we're stopping admissions or reducing admissions uh, because of reduced workforce, our strategy was to keep admitting everybody that we could admit and then decrease the number of services that they were getting. And, the, and our data actually bears out that that's exactly what was happening. Next slide, please. This is our drug and alcohol services, which is a little bit of a different picture. Uh, we've had an increase in the number of services that we've provided uh, 2019 through 2020. Some of that was a result of uh, 
trying to address the drug and alcohol issue differently and trying to uh, get people, uh, co-occurring clinicians trained up and uh, trying to beef up services there. So we've actually done better in the number of services for drug and alcohol. But we're at a point where we, between our three counties, we have the equivalent of only three full-time drug and alcohol counselors working for us. So those numbers really don't uh, show a whole lot. Next slide, please. Again, showing the number of clients served. So here we have fewer clients that are coming in, but those clients who are coming in are getting a larger number of services in our drug and alcohol program. Next slide, please. This is the one that is really more concerning to me, I guess from a fiscal perspective. Uh, the top line here is looking at our, uh, the number of people that we have served at our evaluation and treatment facility. We've had a 21% decrease in the number of bed days that we've filled. Uh, as I said earlier, averaging only 67% of our beds filled on average in 2022. And that's really a direct result of workforce shortage, combined with COVID outages. And of course, when we start getting patients sick with COVID, it spreads to staff and vice versa. So uh, for example, today I've got one patient who's COVID positive in our unit and despite our efforts to try and isolate that person, we've had to uh, cap our admissions. Uh, and over the weekend, we will not, we have nine people in our facility for 16 beds and we will not exceed that because uh, COVID is impacting our, um, our staff as well as the patient. And we try and isolate people with COVID in our seclusion and restraint rooms. And we've had an increase in actually assault of patients recently who need those seclusion and restraint rooms. So it's a very delicate balance between trying to isolate people uh, versus needing to have the full uh, facility available for seclusion and restraint. This decrease uh, in, in our bed days has cost us a half million dollars this year. Next slide, please. Uh, again, same thing, just looking at the uh, reduction in the number of people that we've served at our inpatient unit. So we're down 30, uh, 33%. Next slide, please. Same thing with jail services. We try and use uh, case managers, uh, some of our crisis team and our master's level clinicians to uh, get into our three county jails to provide uh, a small number of services that are funded with ASO dollars for inmates in the jail. Um, and because of workforce shortage, we just have not been able to get in the jail and provide those services. So across the board, the workforce shortage is having a direct impact on our ability to provide the services that we wanna be providing. Next slide, please. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I think, you know, like everybody else, we've tried to be as creative as we possibly can uh, to address workforce shortage. And this is just a quick summary of some of the things that we, do, that we did. Uh, with some of the workforce retention dollars that we got from the ASO when the governor's mandate to become vaccinated went into effect, uh, we paid two different stipends to our workforce who remained with us. Uh, a $500 stipend for every workforce member who was still employed with us the, the day that the vaccine mandate went into effect and another, another $1,500 stipend to the workforce members who remained in our workforce six months afterwards. Uh, and, just, and so you know, that's a sizable dollars for people who are willing to get vaccinated and remain in the workforce. Uh, but still, it's been difficult to keep people and it's been exceptionally difficult up here to recruit people uh, with the vaccine mandate. Um, we've been paying sign-on retentions, particularly for night nurses to be working at our inpatient unit, uh, which has resulted in in the year and a half that we've done that, the recruitment of only one nurse that uh, even cared about that. Uh, we gave out the 2% increase that the legislature gave us a couple of years ago, plus the 7%. We implemented it uh, July 1st on good faith that the healthcare authority would actually get us the 100 million, which thank goodness that uh, they did. Um, still hasn't been enough. And actually, as much as we appreciate the dollars and are trying to, we put every single penny of that into uh, salaries uh, for our uh, workforce across the board increased 7%. And what we're still finding out is that we can't compete uh, with other agencies, including MCOs. Uh, so for example, I was talking with one of my former employees who has a bachelor's level today, who had gone to work for an MCO, it's $73,000 a year. Whereas I start my master's level clinicians, it's $65,000 a year. We still just don't have enough money in the system to be able to compete. And we're continuing to see people going to other state systems and insurance companies rather than sticking with us, despite the additional money that we so desperately need for our workforce. We've been working with recruitment agencies paying up to $18,000 per position uh, to get uh, positions filled. 
And right now I've got recruiters working to fill two master's level positions that we've paid 50% of that recruitment fee up front. They've been working on it for a year. It's resulted in zero uh, case findings. So what we've been doing instead is reclassifying uh, our positions where we have vacant master's level positions. We're underfilling them with bachelor's level staff. We're limiting vacant master's level positions and replacing them with nurse practitioners uh, because we've been able to more successfully recruit some of those positions recently. So I'm paying nurse practitioners a far higher salary to do not just medication prescribing, but also assessments and therapy because we can't find other master's level staff. We've eliminated certified nursing assistants from our workforce at our inpatient facilities and replaced those with what we call behavioral health technicians who don't require the same level of training as CNAs because we simply couldn't find any more CNAs. We've had clinicians that uh, are stationed in one office location, for example, Ferry County, that we would shift around to provide services in Lincoln County and in Stevens County in order to help fill gaps. We've relied on telehealth services. Um, we have uh, rented an apartment in Stevens County that we use as a recruitment tool. So when new people do come on, we let them live in that apartment six month rent free while they're looking for housing. And we still can't get people to come up here because of housing, sh housing shortages. Uh, and finally, this last summer, we said we have to start having a, a wait list on assessments because uh, our clinicians were just too overloaded. In Stephen, in my Colville office, for example, I should have 10 master's level staff working. I have three master's level staff working in Colville right now. Um, and so we, we've just had to push out a wait list. Final slide, please. So like, like Jeff, I guess our wish list is finding the sweet spot between the need to build new programs uh, versus facing the reality of the workforce shortage that we have. And every time I see, you know, Commerce sending out uh, RFPs for agencies to be building new facilities, it literally scares me because I know that we don't have the workforce to staff the current agencies that we have. So I wish that for a period of time, we could put a pause on trying to add new programs and new facilities. Um, next thing that I said here is that, you know, nothing is cheap anymore. Um, we've, we've had to be moving. Uh, we actually had a, a bachelor's level, a bachelor's level clinician um, leave our agency and go to work for children's administration, where she was able to make more money than one of my master's level clinicians who'd been working with us for 10 years would be able to earn. We just can't compete with the salaries that the other state agencies and the insurance companies are paying. So we, even though we've had the 7%, we still need more to be able to compete with uh, the rest of the world out there. Um, we're still dealing with problems with housing and childcare locally that uh, becomes a barrier to workforce. We wish that we could reduce some of the requirements uh, for behavioral health intake assessments. I mean, if you were to come to us and to try and get into services today, it takes an hour and a half for a, a new person to get into services because of the requirements for what goes into an assessment. And as much as we talk about having behavioral health try and become more like the medical system, I've never spent an hour and a half with my medical doctor. Uh, so I wish that we could change some of the requirements for what we have to do to get people into behavioral health services. I wish that we could allow master's level clinicians to provide drug and alcohol services without having to go back and pick up an associate of arts degree uh, because many of my master's level clinicians are more than capable of providing those drug and alcohol services, but there's um, blocks to letting that happen. Uh, the state pa paid medical leave program that went into effect a, a year and a half, two years ago has killed us. Uh, we've got people that are taking medical leave right now in ways that they never have before um, because they're getting paid not to come to work. And that's been just a real challenge for us. And finally, as much as I am a firm vaccine believer, um, the, the policies around COVID-19 have really been a workforce killer for us. And I wish that we could, um, I wish we could find a, a different solution to that other than saying that we can't hire people who haven't been vaccinated. Uh, so that's my presentation and I'll pass it back to you, Justin. Thank you, David. I'm uh, just checking to see if there's any questions or comments before I open up for Nicole. Uh, we are hitting up against time, so I want to make sure I give enough uh, response time for those that are listed here. Nicole, are you on the line? I am, Justin. Thank you. <clears throat> Over to you. All right. Well, 
Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Van Grimbergen. I am the executive director of Pottery County Counseling. Um, you know, I <laughs> thank you, David, for articulating and presenting all of that material. I think it is all very, uh, very much real and we are living it and we are seeing it. Um, as a new director here in Pottery County, when I started in July, one of the first things I looked at is just our, our workforce in general, where we were, where we are, and kind of where we're going. Um, and I can definitely say that here in this agency that we are not as large as um, New Axe or even Frontier. Uh, from 2019 until current date, if you were to look at number for number, position for position, we have essentially turned over every single position. So when you look at 30 positions and essentially you have lost that many employees back to back to back, uh, that's a pretty scary prevalent situation. Um, we, like New Acts, have also been looking at reclassifying some positions. Uh, we have opted here internally to take on more bachelor level. Uh, we've also looked at taking on more interns or practicum students um, just to fill gaps that are much needed. Currently, right now in house, we are sitting at uh, three master's level. Uh, we we typically like to have six, the more the merrier. Uh, and with those three, one of those is our clinical director. So on top of their duties, their responsibilities, now they're having to fill in for all the other shortcomings that we may have as an agency. Um, you know, I, I will tell you what I'm also seeing is that when you start making some of those concessions and you're bringing in, you know, bachelor level, now you're working with a lot more green staff that have not a whole lot of experience and you're basically giving them a foot in the door, which is great, but it also adds workload for training and trying to get them up so that the services that are being provided uh, to the clients are, are beneficial. And um, SUD counselors or chemical dependency, we're we're still at one. We have one staff member aside from our clinical director, and we're seeing an uptick in the amount of individuals accessing SUD or chemical dependency services in Pondere County. Uh, it is it is a very frightening experience seeing that it's taking 18 months or longer to fill some of our vacancies. Uh, some, you know, again, admin staff, those are a lot easier to get, but we're just not seeing the qualified applicants at the master's level either. Uh, we are getting master's level, but interestingly enough, these master's degrees are not equivalent under Department of Health guidelines for being qualified to provide behavioral health services at MHPs. So with that, those are, you know, I guess some of my wish list items where I look at is, you know, hopefully maybe the state can look at some alternatives with those allied degrees for master's level to maybe ease some of the tension on the qualifiers there. Um, other than that, I think David said, everything that else that could be said. Uh, and I do know that we are running short on time. So very much, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Nicole. And I want to make sure I open it up for Adams County as well. I know that you, Adams County had indicated they did not have anything to share on this one, but I just want to make sure that we provide an opportunity if there is anything you would like to share, uh, either Vicki or Amanda, if you're on the line. Hearing nothing or anything in the chat. Um, any questions for the providers that did speak from the group? So I guess this is Commissioner CUNY again, and I just wanna say thank you for articulating that and uh, letting us know. I mean, as you know, um, just, just know if there's anything that I can do in uh, lobbying the state. Um, I know you guys are out there yourselves too, but um, anything that I can do, because I mean, again, as, as a commissioner, we're seeing it from the perspective that everybody wants to have these services, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in homelessness or, or any of that. And so I completely understand that, you know, building more capital facilities at this point in time when we can't staff it or we don't have the operating dollars to operate it um, is not beneficial to anybody. Um, and I keep hearing as, as I'm out in the community, um, you know, more and more needs for, for mental health services. Um, and, and I don't always know what that means. And so, you know, Jeff, I guess that's why I was asking you on the code of play teams because I'm hearing, you know, the, the need there. 
um, you know, we get these grants um, and these opportunities to do this, but if we don't have the staff to do it, it's, it's really um, not helpful to our community. And, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can. So anything that I can do as a commissioner, please let me know. And I hope, you know, it, like I said, this is very, very sobering. Um, you know, we can have all these task force to, to talk about the mental health needs um, for our youth, for our, our homeless, for our citizens, you know, our employees, um, but without having uh, the staff to do it um, and provide the services, it's, it's just, like I said, very sobering. So um, let me know. I know we may be running out of time, but feel free to, you know, also, uh, you know, touch base with me outside of this. Um, but if, Jeff, I see you're unmuted, so I'll let you speak. No, I'm just, just going to say thank you for that, and it reiterates, you know, and the, the sentiment you've uh, conveyed previously, and and definitely I'll I'll uh, keep you in the loop as we're developing our legislative advocacy, uh, and some of the things we'll be uh, hoping that can make a difference. So thank you for that offer. Yeah, I'm happy to, and then you know, get you know. Um, I just got back from a you know a WASAC meeting, so the Association of County Commissioners, um, and um, I am president this year, and so I'm again happy to use that platform to, uh, as I talk to legislators, to to do whatever I can. So um, I know uh, there's other groups that are advocating, but um, I I am happy to personally uh, go talk to people. Hey, Jeff, Dave, and Nicole, just want to say thank you again. I think just very well articulated in terms of the data and some of the, you know, key data points. I mean, Jeff, the survey pieces and David, your slides, which I um, made many notes here, I think very consistent with certainly our thinking from the state agency. Um, anyhow, just wanted to express my thanks again, and, and Nicole, your um, affirmation from Ponderé County. Anyhow, Jeff, David, thanks again for your leadership and partnership on this, and look forward to however we can be helpful as we venture into this next legislative session and, and beyond. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, this is Justin with that. I just want to stress too, from the ASO's perspective and the avenues and the uh, partnerships that we're working on in collaboration with our Medicaid side, healthcare authority, we're in complete alignment and follow through with Commissioner Cooney. Uh, oftentimes uh, you see our faces more, but uh, the extension there on uh, Commissioner Cooney and our commissioners across the county is commitment to ensure those services ASO uh, is uh, doing its best to continue that same message on the avenues that we have as well. Any other comments or questions? All right, uh, moving right along here, we'll turn it over to Allison, get our all together. Excellent. I'll unmute myself appropriately now and not deal with the sick kid that was hovering in my <laughs> background earlier. So my apologies there. Um, it is hard to believe we are coming to the end of year six of uh, what we are now affectionately referring to as waiver 1.0. Um, so this last month has been a active period for our waiver finance work group who has officially wrapped up their work because they have allocated all of the funds um, that we expect to re receive out of waiver 1.1.0 oh. so i wanted to just highlight um, that we are on track to earn a little over 60 million dollars over this uh which actually is an eight year period, but it's a six year demonstration uh, calendar a year. Um, and so we are just really grateful for the set of partners that we have had working with us on clinical integration, on chronic disease management, on opioid response and on community, uh, community based care coordination. Uh, as part of our wrapping things up, we have made a commitment to get as many dollars out the door in 23 and 24 as we have available uh, to us. So I thought I'd just do a 
quick rundown of dollars that we expect to be, um, I'm going to say RFPing. Some of them are a traditional RFP, um, and some will be a little bit more directed dollars. But we've got 3.6 million in our community linkages RFP. That is work that we are trying to support that connects the healthcare setting with the um, with a social determinant of health setting. So could be food, could be housing, could be transportation or workforce development or that that type of that type of thing. We're really excited. This will be the second round of funding um, that we are doing in that area. We have about three million dollars left in. Um, a combination of provider funds for integration, as well as about a million and a half dollars left in our integration fund. Those dollars are being um, directed and influenced by our behavioral health work group. And to date, there's been a really high emphasis on anything we could possibly do to support uh, the workforce crisis um, that we are at. So. Um, I was feeling a little proud of having $3 million, and after those presentations, well, that's just going to be a drop in the bucket, but uh, we are we are hopeful to help uh, relieve some 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 pressure on, on somewhere in the in the system. We also um, have allocated a couple of specific rural funds um, for the coming year. We have $600,000 um, for a rural school-based healthcare initiative um, that is really playing off of some awesome work that we have seen transpire um, up in Pondere County with the Newport, a partnership between Newport schools and the public hospital up there, as well as here between um, Spokane Public Schools, Chaz and Unify. So uh, we think that's gonna be uh, pretty cool stuff coming forward. An additional $500,000 to support a rural equity uh, strategy. And that work will really start with some listening sessions in our rural communities about how we can develop a uh, collaborative approach to uh, really addressing some of the health inequities that exist. Um, and then I know it's quite a list, isn't it? Uh, 2.3 million for capacity building dollars has been allocated. Um, and that will be both to support some of our equity organizational development work, as well as um, capacity building within our community uh, partners over overall. And you may have seen that we um, last week or so, uh, released our second installment of our Community Resilience Fund um, focused on addressing racism as a public health crisis. Uh, so that is live and folks can um, apply for those funds right now. We have about $2 million to allocate for, uh, for that. So there is going to be lots of dollars flowing, uh, flowing out to our uh, partners in the, in the coming year. We've got a little bit of money left to earn that we will see in June of 2023 and a little bit more in June of 2024. And then we will call this waiver done and start moving on to the 2.0. Um, and so we are uh, super excited and really grateful to the healthcare authority for the big vision that they have for waiver 2.0 and a really important um, and highlighted role for accountable communities of health to further support community-based care coordination, equity, integration, all the all the good stuff moving moving forward. So our fingers are crossed that those negotiations will go smoothly and rapidly, might I say, um, for uh, for some implementation um, sometime next year. I think that's what I've got for folks today. I realize I probably stand between you and the end of your work week. So I will I will call it there and look forward to uh, some deeper conversations with many of you as we move into 23. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. Any questions for Allison before we go to the next topic? Okay. See none in the chat. Uh, I get to be the 
runner up. So bear with me. I'm going to give a quick update on the uh, ASO efforts that we've been putting out uh, for our region. So uh, we've been really busy. As you know, we're getting up to a legislative session. So uh, we've been uh, involved in advocating for our region for this month, at the same time continuing our existing programming, uh, which we've seen just a higher acuity across the board. Uh, Spokane Regional uh, Service Area is unique in the fact that we do provide voluntary services along with involuntary. And so we continue to support our region for the uh, individuals who are non-Medicaid uh, to receive inpatient psychiatric and substance use services, uh, which is critical to our region to ensuring ongoing uh, sustainable care. And also hitting that gap area where there's a lot of individuals that we recognize still need uh, services that are not being covered. Um, alongside that, we have been pushing a lot of innovative new programs because we recognize there's so many gaps that still exist within the system. So um, in conjunction and uh, with the direction of our uh, county commissioners, a uh, bunch of new programs have gone out this year targeting youth and, uh, and families. And so uh, in this last uh, year, we started a teen text line uh, providing direct services for youth to receive behavioral services, information and connection uh, and resources. So that has been amazing. It's a peer led service. Uh, that has been up and running for the last 10 months, and we've seen an increased uh, access uh, across our region. Uh, we've pushed out a uh, children, youth, and family mobile crisis team specifically designed to uh, respond to youth and families uh, in, the, in the hope and the goal to prevent ongoing crisis so that the uh, individuals who are involved in the system don't consistently uh, find themselves at the 988 or uh, regional crisis line that they're receiving those the community. And Frontier Behavioral Health is uh, our front on that here in Spokane County. And then we also, uh, after a lot of work with the healthcare authority, were awarded the MRSS grant, Mobile Response and Stabilization Services with SAMHSA, which was uh, an amazing new program funded for a five-year uh, project that enhances further stabilization in the community for services not covered. So we really firmly believe these services going into 2023 are going to hit and target a continuum of care for youth and families that is critical to our communities. In addition, we uh, also pushed out the Homeless Outreach and Stabilization Transition Program, also with Frontier. Uh, we hope to get that up and running next year. I know, Jeff, you had mentioned all these new programs and, and the staff, but at the same time, uh, we implemented these in the recognition that they needed to be sustainable in funding. And so, again, at the direction of our commissioners, these programs were implemented strategically so that they didn't overwhelm the system and the funding was sufficient for the providers. And I think our, uh, those on the call that have taken on these new programs have seen this uh, responsiveness to ensuring our region is uh, made whole, especially with new programming. Uh, and then with passages, family support, we also have a new peer path binder jail transitions to support individual transitioning from an incarcerated setting, reducing recidivism, and hopefully connecting them to necessary behavioral services. Again, just furthering that continuum from our jail uh, mental health unit into the community so there isn't a recidivism into the co-responder teams or into, uh, in a, like I said, in an incarcerated setting. And then we've also are looking at new program coming in the future. Uh, one of the ones we're most excited about is our uh, youth programs. And we've had four schools now uh, targeted for this school-based expert it's an initiative for student wellness and recognizing the need is there for youth, but now hitting them on, not on the back end after a crisis is occurred, but on the front end, how can we begin preventing it? And I just received an update from all the schools involved in the project. And there has been such an overwhelming um, uh, positive response. The schools have already screened the classes, other classes want them. And we've also had additional uh, schools request involvement and families, which because of our staffing, we've had to limit engagement. And so I cannot stress the need is there and the community knows that and the schools have said, this has been one of the best things to come out uh, in response to COVID. So we're gonna be pushing hard on that and expanding it here in the next year. And then we should have additional data to demonstrate uh, the uh, need that we're seeing. But just the preliminary data we're seeing already demonstrates that out of the students that were screened both in the middle school and high school, 45% of students overall have required a follow-up, have engagement with our clinicians. That could be anything from a, a, a tier three, which is a crisis engagement to reduce suicidal or homicidal ideation or just uh, academic support. So 
uh, 45% and the need has only increased because we've been receiving requests outside of the screening process. And so we've had to uh, essentially uh, put a wait list because we don't have enough staff. So a lot of great work that's coming down in our region, but a lot of stuff we're working through with workforce. So that's a quick update. You'll see I added just a quick bulletin that we're making available to our region and our providers. Uh, we've been doing that uh, on a monthly basis, so we should be pushing a new one out. And we've also been working uh, really closely with Frontier on 90 day implementation. So we expect a lot of new crisis system uh, changes to occur in 2023. And we're on the forefront of ensuring that those are made responsive to our region. So that's our quick update on the ASO side. I know that was quick, uh, but I know individuals, this is the last part of a Friday. So any questions uh, or uh, feedback on what was just shared? And I do wanna turn it over to Commissioner Kennedy to give a quick update as well. There has been some changes in our community service department. Uh, as you may all know and heard, uh, because this was released, Kathleen Torella, our director, will be leaving us next week uh, and transitioning to uh, a new future. And so I wanna turn it over to Commissioner Cooney for a response to that as well. Yeah, I just wanna give a shout out to Kathleen. I mean, she has some job here at Spokane County and I'm very sad to see her uh, choosing to move on. And so I just want to acknowledge that um, to, to all of you and to, to her that I'm, you know, so appreciative to her service. Uh, she really has, you know, had the community, uh, you know, in the best interest of, of the community in her heart. And um, I think has done a great job uh, as we transition, you know, from being the regional RSN to the BHASO, as I get on my acronyms right there. Um, so I just want to, you know, just a shout out to Kathleen um, and just uh, the care that she's had and, and the um, wisdom she's given all of us. So I just wanted to say that publicly for everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Cooney. I know that we're all going to, uh, myself, uh, more selfishly, I think, going to miss Kathleen and her uh, direction there. So uh, if anyone wants to uh, reach out and express, uh, please uh, let us know and we can definitely share those. And then uh, as always, this is an open meeting. We wanna make sure to uh, open this up to any public comments uh, to the community or community members, or even to those here on the call to ensure that we hear from any public members. So this is the time we open it up for any comment or feedback. And we're not seeing anyone online. I'm not seeing any hands, anything in the chat. No one here in, in person. So, um, okay, I think we just need to. Yes, so if there's no public comment, we will, the last thing we wanna end with the meeting is uh, just to remind individuals that we have uh, the amended charter that we've signed, uh, we want to make sure to bring those forward to our commissioner. So for those that still need to sign, please make sure that you do and then return it to us. If you have any questions on that, the email address for our uh, admin support here, uh, Joanne is made available, please reach out. And we can answer any questions you have on getting those done. And then uh, for our 2023 quarterly meeting schedule, uh, we have yet to determine final ones. I know it usually falls on a March but at the time that we continued the square list meetings, there was a conversation on how the frequency. And, and so uh, recognizing that this is open meetings as well as the commissioners and the uh, regional counties commissioners are on this as well. We wanna make sure to be responsive to the uh, timeframes that they're available and made uh, this available to the community. So, uh, this is a time we're having any open feedback. Normally we'd have it for March. Anyone want to share their thoughts? Everyone's still comfortable with a quarterly schedule or there had been talk about moving it to twice a year instead of the quarterly one? No feedback here, uh, don't feel any pressure. You can definitely reach out and provide those. We'll make sure that the commissioners are made aware. Uh, 
so that any feedback there is incorporated into decision making moving forward. You know, Justin, I would just offer maybe one uh, one other option could be um, having three in the course of the year. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that myself too, Jeff. So I think that that could be what we tend to do because I think just twice a year may not be enough. You know, I, there just seems to be enough information that is uh, happening that we need to all be aware of. So, uh, so maybe if we do three and space mm -hmm. it out uh, accordingly that way. Um, so, yeah. okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, oftentimes what we like to do is reach out to the membership and see if there's any topics. And so uh, right now the, the charter allows for the quarterly meetings, but is deferred to the commissioners to determine uh, if those will be held. And so what we can do is reach out if there isn't any agenda topics and it's determined it may not be beneficial, we could always bump it to the next one. So we could leave it as a uh, discretion dependent upon topics that are being uh, forward. I know in the March one, we're gonna have it right in the middle of legislative session. So that might be a pertinent one to discuss uh, ongoing topics. Uh, also, it may be a busy time. So uh, I'll leave everyone with that. Again, please provide us feedback and we'll definitely uh, make sure that that's available to the, the commissioners. And then I guess, David, I just wanna check with you if you're okay with us sending out um, your slides to everyone that's on the call. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. I get my thoughts in regards to the meeting. I mean, we certainly could live with three meetings a year. My only thought is that I think that this is going to be another busy year with Medicaid re-procurement, ongoing workforce challenges, uh, the need to implement same-day services next year, which I think is going to present us all with pronounced challenges given the workforce. So, you know, I I I would be happy if we stayed with four uh, meetings a year, but I could certainly live with three. No, and this is, you know, ensuring that we're providing the service to you as well. So, um, so no, I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. I guess, David, we can make you and Jeff arm wrestle it for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what we'll do then is move forward with um, uh, scheduling our normal uh, time frame for the March. We'll make sure to reach out and then, of course, make that available to the commissioners too, because it has to go forward to them for final approval. So just be prepared to see a tentative schedule for the March coming forward in the new year. Excellent. Uh, that concludes the meeting. So I wanna make sure to have any last comments from anyone here or the commissioner. Yeah, we're not seeing any. So then we will officially adjourn uh, the meeting for today. Thank you all very much for participating and. Um, really great information. Uh, appreciate it and look forward to March. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.